you've watched, uh, you've been a police chief, obviously, and a councilman. You've been watching what's going on in Ferguson. What are you seeing there that uh, that gives you concern? Is there anything to be learned, either in what they're doing or what they should be doing, uh, that, that would be a benefit to people here in Los Angeles? What I've seen uh, primarily from the first day has been a total inconsistency in how they've approached the issue. Almost every day they've had a different approach. Uh, they also have a variety of jurisdictions involved, which appears to be not one single operation is coordinating them. Mm -hmm. And it appears that they have done some very basic things wrong, uh, such as uh, addressing uh, or combining multi-jurisdictions in the field and, and basically not segmenting them so they can work together, mm -hmm. uh, using uh, the show of force, which appears to be overt at sometimes with little uh, return on their investment. But the two major things I think that they've missed is they've allowed a lot of peripheral issues to get in the way and they forget that the number one reason that they are there is to investigate the shooting and determine whether it was proper or improper. Mm -hmm. And the second issue is to remove law violators so that people can protest uh, legally and also keep the, sa the city safe. Those two issues get lost in all of the discussions. And do you think that this area, this part of the country, LA, city, county, are better equipped uh, to deal with these kinds of problems? Do we understand those issues better? What I found out on these issues, you're as good as your last one. <laughs> you can do them quite well, and then all of a sudden you'll end up with a May Day like we had in Los Angeles, and everybody wonders what happened to all the training, what happened to all of the years of history. Mm. So if it starts off bad, it rarely becomes good. So you are on a day-to-day -day operation as to how you deal with the training is important, the leadership is important, but again, you can make a false step at any given time. Uh -huh. Supervisor, how about you? You have uh, at least indirect responsibility for the Sheriff's Department of the county. What's your sense of, of how the Sheriff's Department is doing these days, what its relationship is like uh, with the poor minority communities? How, how comfortable are you are with the state of the Sheriff's Department? Well, I'm hardly comfortable. I think the Sheriff's Department knows that it can and should do much better, and they are obliged to do so. Uh, this is why there was a commission on jail violence, as an example, which came forward with multiple recommendations, which we are now implementing. And there is a long way to go. We now have an inspector general, but I essentially see that as a half loaf. This uh, county needs to have an oversight commission which gives full scrutiny to the range of issues that any modern police force of that size would require and there are lessons to be learned it seems to me uh, from Ferguson there are lessons to be learned uh, here in Los Angeles uh, in the county as well as in the city and I would say this uh, that the the need for uh, oversight is fundamentally important, uh, but there's a level of civic engagement that's conspicuously absent in Ferguson. If you look at the demographics of that city and its representation on its governing body, the city council and in the executive branch of government, there's a disparity that's essentially indefensible. And so there's a breakdown civically, it would seem to me, in that uh, city that has to be corrected at multiple levels. And how about the issue of racial diversity, and specifically in law enforcement agencies, we note that there are very few, uh, almost no, uh, black officers uh, at the uh, in the Ferguson Department. There's been a great effort here over the years to diversify both the sheriffs and LAPD. How much difference is that made, or is that made? It's fundamentally <clears throat> important. I believe the law enforcement to be effective in serving uh, the residents, the citizenry of any jurisdiction, has to, in some way, reflect the composition of the um, communities that it is uh, sworn uh, to protect and serve. That is obviously not the case in Ferguson. It was not the case um, in the city of Los Angeles, um, going back to uh, the first major um, uh, display of civil unrest in the 1960s, specifically 1965. Um, and the diversity of the department from top to bottom strikes me as being fundamentally important and also as it relates to uh, gender equity issues. All of these things are basic because problems will happen. The question is uh, what preparation has been made to prevent them from happening and there are some basic best practices and promising practices that obviously Ferguson has failed to pay close enough attention to and frankly 
uh, the Los Angeles Police Department and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department uh, have work to do to uh, improve as well. Mm -hmm. And is that something you think the Citizens Commission could be of assistance with? I have no doubt about it because there would be sustained attention paid to the Sheriff's Department in the way that it happens in the city. Absent that, it's left to the City Council, which mm -hmm. has many other things to do. As you know, I served on that body I for more that. than a decade. Uh, now serving on the city, uh, on the Board of Supervisors, we even have more things to do than would be the case with the City Council. So to expect us to have an oversight uh, function with respect to the Sheriff's Department that is authentic is just simply preposterous. Aaron, you wrote the other day on our pages uh, about the importance of seeing uh, the victim, uh, in this case, uh, Michael Brown, as a person uh, rather than as a symbol. Right. Uh, I'm curious whether you think that's happened, uh, whether that transition has happened. And I also am curious what, what your thoughts are about the officer uh, who did the shooting, whether, whether he too has become more of a symbol than a person and whether there's merit to reevaluating re him as well. Um, yeah, well... This is just really discouraging to me, just kind of being here talking about this again, uh -huh. writing about it again. I feel uh -huh. like I've been writing the same thing for 20 years. Yeah. Um, in one way or another, that um, it always, to me, reduces to, uh, particularly in police shootings, which always involves a, a young black male and uh, a police officer, mm -hmm. um, it really gets down to the devaluation of black life. And it's not... It's not just that the pol that's something the police believe or have internalized. It's something all of us have. It's it's the reason why I hear all the discussions I hear about this this incident. There are a lot of people who say, well, he, sh he just should have obeyed the law. What was he doing, trying to steal something? And you know, and it goes down that road. And so they really, mm -hmm. immediately, you don't have a discussion about. You don't have a view that this is an 18 year old person mm -hmm. who didn't deserve to be shot like this. And I think it's just so embedded. In, in everyone's view, and that kind of goes across the board. I have to catch myself thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that is definitely not changed. I and mean, people are, many people are saying, yes, you know, this is a, you know, uh, this is a human being, a young man. President Obama said it, and that's kind of all he said. But I, as I said in the piece that I wrote, it'll take more than that subliminal messaging to really change things. Because I don't really think, I mean, as important as the Police reform is and, and the tactics and you know the, the, the militarizing of the uh, uh, of, of police. That's not really the issue. It's really how we view black people in these mm. places. I live in a place very similar. I mean, Inglewood is 120,000 people, but we've had same issues with police uh, a few years ago. Maybe it was 2009, 2010. We had a rash of five officer-involved shootings in a couple of months in the summertime, um, and we have a pretty diverse police force. I, I'm sure. So, um, you know, it's just, uh, I, I don't quite know what the next step is, mm -hmm. but I just, you know, uh, I just worry that we have to have more and more of these kind of incidents to keep bringing us back to this to this kind of root cause, which to me is really in a way more spiritual than it is tactical mm -hmm. or, or political. Is there any information that could be learned in the course of this investigation, the, of the shooting itself, yeah. that might change your perspective of it? I mean, if it turned out that there was a real struggle in the car, say, I d it really it certainly doesn't change yeah. the, the larger topics sure. you're talking about, but uh, are there facts to be known that would cause you to think differently about it? Maybe. This? I mean, we're not yeah. at the bottom of this yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, um, and I hate to say, do the what-ifs, but let's say, let's say Mike, Michael Brown did steal the cigars and uh, let's say he did get into a confrontation with the officer. That's kind of an individual um, uh, thing that really doesn't address the bigger, the, the bigger, broader um, uh, problem of the, you know, the uh, kind of the dehumanization of, of these young men. I mean, they're always going to be guilty people, um, but yeah, I have to, I have to go back to why was he stopped in the first place, being on the sidewalk? Of course, if he did reach inside the car, he shouldn't have done that. Of course. But that starts to immediately get away from the issue of why was he stopped, uh, how was he viewed, um, you know. Um, and I make make the point in my piece that he is literally a target: tall, dark skin, heavy set. You know, he is he is the. Um, uh, I mean, all black males are under suspicion. He is, I think, the physical type that that is under the most suspicion. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things left to be sure. answered. As for Darren Wilson. Um, we're just at the beginning of that. I, 
I can't really say anything about um, that. Um, of course, I think everyone should be viewed as a human being and, and as an individual. But you know that that wish to be view, viewed as an individual just runs right up against our history of viewing people collectively and negatively, mm -hmm. and we have to somehow resolve that. Mm -hmm. Professor, uh, if you can hear me out there, uh, your thoughts uh, on, on this sort of collective versus individual uh, perception uh, that police officers and others uh, may have of young black men, um, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I share Aaron's sense of uh, deja vu to ad, ad, ad nauseum, right? Um, it seems like Groundhog Day we're stuck in in a very bad sense of, in a, in a very bad sense of the word. I'm, I think in my book I wrote in 97 um, was about this very issue, and here we are in 2004, and I can't say that anything's changed. I tell my students, ain't nothing changed but the year it is, in terms of the issues that keep on coming up that, that Aaron was getting at. Right here at USC, for example, last year, 2013, we ran a little controlled experiment with the LAPD. We didn't know it was a controlled experiment at the time, but they... Uh, came to two house parties, graduation parties, that were allowed. Uh, the officers went to the white party and told them to turn it down. I'm there was okay. no further interaction. They went to the black party, and it very soon escalated into 79 riot-geared police officers descending on the gra black graduation USC party and when I held the town hall meeting, we had the inspector general and the, the, the higher brass. I'm sorry? No, I'm sorry. Good. I think we're okay. Keep talking. Yeah, we had, the, uh, we, had the, we had the inspector general. We had higher brass in the LAPD, um, police commission folk there. And one of the higher brass in the LAPD said, you know, in the 80s and 90s, our approach to policing was, Zero tolerance. If you spit on the sidewalk, if you if you if you if you jaywalk, you are face down on the asphalt. That was and this is this is coming from a white officer, higher brass. He said we've changed now. Under the consent decree, there's been a change, a change for the better. There there were some hiccups. MacArthur Park that Bernard Parks mentioned a little earlier, the May Day problem. There have been some hiccups, but I think LAPD has made some real strides. But it shows you even when LAPD has made a lot of good strides. You have incidents like 2013. We had white students coming up to the microphone and saying, um, I was at the party across the street. And the police didn't bring in 79 riot police for us, and they brought in a helicopter. It was a whole militarization approach to the interaction with these, with these uh, young black scholars. So it is a, a pervasive concern and, and one that we had, we're struggling with even here in, in L.A. And what about, uh, we've talked a lot about responsibility of police um, and accountability for police. There are also people throwing Molotov cocktails, uh, looting stores uh, in Ferguson. Uh, some accountability owed there, too. Oh, yeah. Well, here's, here's what we have. You know, uh, one of the problems in a place like Ferguson or 92 here, um, when we have the 92 riots in L.A., because as, as um, both um, um, Thomas and, and Parks have pointed out, you know, we go back to Watts. And when it comes to urban uprising, L.A. is kind of has set the gold standard. Watts, right? frustration in the black community, police setting it off at Tinderbox 92, police again. And yes, you know, often it's said, aren't, isn't there some personal responsibility on the part of these hoodlums not to engage in this kind of behavior? The problem with that argument is they used it in, in 92. They said they were just hoodlums who were looking for any reason to loot and pillage. So, but the problem with that argument is, if that was the case, they had ample opportunity to just go off and act crazy when the airwaves were being saturated by the beatdown of Rodney King. But they didn't. They waited for justice. They waited for the Simi Valley jury to return his verdict. And they didn't take to the street until the promise of justice seemed so blatantly flouted by that Simi Valley jury verdict, which was at odds with what they saw with their own eyes on the video of Rodney King getting beaten down. So it's not hoodlums just looking for any excuse. It's, it's very frustrated people who, when justice seems so flagrantly flouted after so many years of living in an unjust existence in this nation, they've reached that, 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 that breaking point. It's a tinderbox, and any spark is enough to make it go off. So, yeah, we, we, we can go down the personal responsibility road, but we will lose sight of what really contributes to these kinds of issues going forward if we do. 
your reaction to that, Councilman? Um, the, the description of the of the what led up to the '92 riots and the balance between personal responsibility and police accountability here. All of it's a balance. I think the problem that I have is that you can go back to '65, and I believe it's the Kerner report. Mm -hmm. You could read it today, and almost everything in there that said mm -hmm. this caused the '65 riot yeah. are still alive today. So when you have things that are just under the skin, it never goes away. And so all you need is a flashpoint. And I think that's the same thing, even though 65 was caused by CHP arresting a drunk driver, it's police in general that people look at. They collectively view it. If you do something in New York or Florida, it's the police in general. The police have a mindset that is all individual in one, one uh, identify one specific incident. The community views it collectively. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the dilemma. You, if you never solve it, then it's just under the skin and it just requires a minor spark. And so even and the other thing I think we've, we have is no one ever quite understands what, even though we're using the same words, what does justice mean to all the people that are saying it? When we see in Ferguson they're saying, you know, one lady said, arrest, grand jury, conviction. You <coughs> said, well, should we get the report done? Uh, these are things that everybody's view of justice might be just a little different and whatever the outcome is, it's not going to satisfy a large number of people. So we use words sometimes with no definition and it comes back to haunt us. Yeah. Asking Supervisor, this may be a naive question, but why is the flashpoint in these incidents so often between uh, black community and police? We don't, I mean, there are occasional clashes, May Day, someone mentioned it a little bit, there was a more, more Latino crowd, but this, over and over, what we see uh, predominantly is uh, largely black communities in conflict with, in many cases, largely white police departments, sometimes more diverse police departments. What is the, what's the reason why we keep revisiting this, why we keep writing the same story that Aaron's been writing since 92? <clears throat> well, I think the history of racism in America cannot be denied. And one of the ways in which it manifests itself is in uh, the area of law enforcement. Uh, it is, uh, in many ways, one of the most fundamental contradictions of the American experience. Uh, the way in which uh, African Americans in particular, but not exclusively, uh, are uh, treated uh, by uh, law enforcement agencies uh, from the local to the federal levels. And uh, it is the uh, essence of which, uh, of what justice is made uh, in terms of pushing for uh, more balanced, more equitable uh, treatment of citizens. And it is in fact uh, embedded in uh, the stereotypical notions that are visited upon uh, African American males in particular. Uh, as Aaron referenced before, it's deeply psychological in many respects. It is historical. It is sociological. Uh, there is no denying of it. One of the recent articles coming out of uh, the uh, issue in Ferguson is this is uh, uh, a part of the uh, population, uh, generally speaking, that's uh, over-policed and under-protected. Um, and uh, the struggle to democratize, uh, to make more credible uh, law enforcement uh, in best case scenarios uh, continues. A lot of work has been done in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles in particular. Uh, the uh, consent decree uh, is no uh, small thing. It was critically important. Uh, the efforts with Measure F to reform uh, the police department limit the terms of the police chief, uh, put in place uh, the issue of a uh, police commission that had more teeth, followed by uh, the issue of an inspector general being installed. All of those things are fundamentally important at a structural level, and still uh, we have incidents like uh, those involving Ezell Ford, um, who um, is diagnosed with uh, uh, certain mental disorders documented as such, and yet uh, the confrontation between uh, the Los Angeles police officers and this young man results in his death. Um, and so there's a narrative here that cannot be ignored and, and or uh, denied. It is deeply rooted in the American experience, centuries old. 
what's been the reaction of people you've talked to to the Izell Fort uh, shooting, uh, which took place obviously quite close in time uh, to this one? Have you been talking to people about it? It's funny. I was talking to my sister about this, and we were talking about Michael Brown, and then she talked about some detail relating to Izell Fort, oh. and I said, "Who are we talking about?" I mean, it's like, and then when she actually mixed up with the, uh, there's another case in New York, I think. Yeah, uh, there is. And truly, we almost had to laugh, I mean, but it wasn't funny, that they all seemed to run together, really. It's terrible. The details are almost interchangeable. It's terrible. And it's funny, one thing I thought was with the Ezel Ford case was, you know, we, re we had last year, you know, the very high profile of case of Kelly Thomas, the yeah. mentally ill young man in Orange County, a lot of, a lot of, um, outrage about that, as there should have been. White. Mm -hmm. But a white guy, you know, who was considered part of the community, etc. And there's some parallel here. I mean, the neighbors, the people who lived in this area said they knew, everyone knew that Diesel Ford was mentally ill, and they had actually said to the officers, he's mentally ill. But there's no par parallel being drawn between that case mm -hmm. and, and Kelly Thomas, which I find interesting and to me speaks again to the kind of the lesser value we assign to black to black people. We do it unconsciously. I want to just say something, uh, continue what um, the supervisor is saying, and also Councilman Parks, um, speaking of the, the, the Kerner Commission report, which I think that's the report that said we do have two Americas, mm -hmm. maybe it was the other report. We <laughs> McCall, McCall. Um, <laughs> a lot of reports. But, but we do have two Americas. We have, we, of course, you know, we're much more diverse society now, but underneath all that are the two Americas, and we keep, and we see those two Americas most clearly when we have these kinds of clashes, because a lot of white people do not understand, why can't you just follow the police orders? What's the problem? I don't <coughs> see the problem, because they don't live the problem. I heard a woman call in on a, a talk show at NPR, of all places, and say, they just need to act like regular people, mm. you know, etc. And even the host had to say, well, what do you mean by <laughs> regular people? And so, it's always remarkable to me. Uh, I think people just are sort of clueless about these sorts of things, and uh, I just I have a neighbor who lives in, on my street, who sends whose kids go to El Segundo High School. El Segundo was a very small town, seventeen thousand mm -hmm. people, its own police force, and it made me think about when you were talking, the the job of any police forces, at least you know some time ago, was to keep that line, was to keep black people out of certain places. That's what they're there to do. And in El Segundo, every time my neighbor goes there to pick up his kids, uh, and he's a tall dark-skinned, heavy-set guy, who's mm -hmm. a professional person, you know, he's a videographer, they stop him every single time. What are you doing here is the question. One time he's actually asked, what are you doing here? I'm here to pick up my kids. One time they asked him to, when his kids came out of school, they said, tell me their names. Okay, and this, and we laugh, because it's, so, <coughs> it's, it's absurd, but it is surreal, and it is something that even we have, black people have internalized as sort of normal. But this is the essence of the indignities to which um, African Americans and other persons of color are routinely subjected to the question, why don't they act like regular people? Uh, there's another question, why aren't they treated like mm. regular people? They are, uh, in fact, American citizens who fought, bled, and died in wars. They're descendants of people who've made considerable contributions to uh, this nation's greatness, and yet uh, we have this documented history of conflict. Um, and the disparities uh, in the enforcement of law, are, uh, those disparities are palpable. Um, and anyone in law enforcement knows that. The way policing happens uh, in South LA as an example, as opposed to the uh, the Palisades is very, very different. Uh, I know this as a result of talking with a number of police chiefs, uh, those who are law enforcement executives, so it's deeply embedded, and that's the stuff of which the consent degree, decree uh, was made. It is essentially uh, why the, the Department of Justice is leaning on the sheriff's department in the county of Los Angeles because of the, this, these disparities, because of the mental health conditions uh, in the jails, because of the jail violence phenomena uh, that affects uh, uh, people in ways that are uh, so dehumanizing until we choose not to speak of it. And so, Jim, I think uh, what we have in Ferguson is once again an opportunity for uh, this nation to look at itself 
and uh, for cities, uh, both large and small, to learn something. I have said uh, that uh, the president uh, should call for a national day of dialogue to confront the question of the issue of officer-involved shootings in communities of color. Deal with the issue head on with police officers as we've done in Los Angeles over the past decade plus interfacing with uh, regular persons. Uh, Chief Parks when he was serving uh, met with uh, gang members and talked with them at the University of Southern California uh, and um, emergency room doctors all saying we've got a problem here we've got to confront it. These things help from the perspective of civic engagement. You need an oversight commission and you need a representative form of government in Ferguson. These are three fundamental things that I think uh, could prove to be helpful for Ferguson and the nation. Professor, uh, we're running low on time, but I did want to come back to you. Uh, the supervisor and uh, the councilman and others have talked about uh, citizens oversight uh, and the importance of it. Uh, are there structural changes that could happen? The, the supervisor talked about some with respect to the sheriff's department. Are there ways to empower citizens to really have an oversight authority that would really alter the relationship between people and, and law enforcement in this region? Well, that, that may help considerably, but there are two really perennial problems that are the source of these continuing issues that we, we keep talking about. Aaron says, you know, it's, we're writing the same article month after month about mm -hmm. the same kinds of issues, sadly. One of those is, is you know, and dialogue isn't going to get, get rid of this fact, uh, blacks engage in disproportionate criminal activity. Statistics, when you have someone like Jesse Jackson saying to all black con congregation in Chicago some years ago, nothing more troubles me at this point in my life than to walk down the street, start hearing suspicious footsteps and thinking robbery, turn around seeing a white face and feeling relieved. Mm -hmm. When Jesse Jackson says that, we know what we have is a, a statistical disproportionality problem when it comes to blacks and crimes that's growing out of social and economic inequality, of course. Um, as long as you have, when I, I just came from San Quentin a little while ago, and what we find is that over 80, in some cases, over 90% of prisoners in high security prisons are from families below the poverty line. So either people are poor because they're bad, or maybe bad because they're poor. The latter is the more likely explanation. You take a group of people, you disproportionately concentrate them in desperate circumstances, and it should sadden but not surprise you if they disproportionately turn to desperate undertakings like crime. But those statistics then make it tough. Those statistics make it hard to tell people not to profile when there's a statistically rational relationship between race and criminality. So that's one problem. The other problem is unconscious bias. The work that I've done a lot lately on my first book, and I'm reading a lot of um, people doing work in the academy now on how it is that racially liberal, well-intentioned people can discriminate unconsciously. They can say um, 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 Jennifer Eberhard up at Stanford, uh, up at Stanford, has done some experiments with officers and with lay people in which they have to make an assessment of an ambiguous person and determine whether he's carrying a weapon or not. And they find that when, when it's a black person, they're more likely to make a mistake about him having a weapon. And the darker he is, the more likely they are to make a mistake about him. And they also find the darker blacks are more, bla are more death worthy when it comes to assessing someone's subjective culpability. So now what we're talking about is a public health problem. You know, we're talking about looking at discrimination as something we all do on an unconscious level. It isn't just something bad people, bigots do. We're past the, you know, the, the uh, civil rights era uh, Archie Bunker model of racism, and we have to start thinking about racial discrimination as something that grows out of social inequality and economic inequality, number one, and unconscious cognitive processes, number two. Those are the twin scourges that we have to tackle today in 2014. The old battle of the civil rights era, conscious Jim Crow, is behind us. These are much tougher t um, issues to tackle, but they're necessary. Chief, Chief, I say Chief, but that, that's an old habit. Uh, <laughs> um, we're about done here, but I just wanted to give the last word to you. Uh, you joined the Los Angeles Police Department, what, some 40 65. years? 1965. Uh, how different uh, is it today from the department? It, you, you know, it's remarkably different, but also what you have to always keep in mind, mm -hmm. every time you declare uh, victory, regression starts. Mm -hmm. So you, it never gets done. You have to work on it, and even in 2014, people will say and do things that shock you and make you think that progress isn't there. 
And I think one of the things I've watched at Ferguson that's mind-boggling to me, to have 70% of your population mm -hmm. African-American mm -hmm. and have seven elected officials, of which one is black, and then to say only t less than 10% of the population that's black vote, if you think about hypothetically, the things that they have grievances about could have probably been impacted a few elections ago mm -hmm. had people did their voter registration card and came out and voted. They would then not have to say chief of police is insensitive. They could have had a voice in who the chief of police. They could have had a mayor that would have been out showing leadership nine days ago, not this morning. I mean, these are things that have been amazing to me yep. that we're talking about the president showing up, the attorney general showing <clears throat> up, all of these people outside, the highway patrol captain. We have not seen, except this morning, the face of a local elected official in the city of Ferguson. That is absolutely mind-boggling that this would go on and not one person been held accountable. Well, with that, uh, I believe we have to bring it to a close. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you uh, for joining us and all of you who are tuning in for doing so for further coverage of uh, Ferguson and these issues. I hope you'll stick with the LA Times uh, and LATimes.com. Thank you very much.